now we'll begin the Q&A session. If you haven't already, please submit any question you have in the Q&A box and you can send those anonymously. Uh, we'll do our very best to get to all the questions as time allows. Now, we've had several questions and, and Tom, I want to I want to start off with with you. Um, we've had some dealing with dicamba uh, or a lot of them with pigweed, but do we have any documented dicamba resistant pigweed in Arkansas? Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, to my knowledge, the quick answer is no. We don't have any dicamba resistant pigweed that we have tested in the greenhouse. And and found to have a tolerance to a field rate of, of uh, any of the labeled dicamba formulations. I will say we are looking at at least three key populations uh, from Northeast Arkansas that we're gonna focus on a lot this winter, uh, just based on some things we saw in the field, uh, potential variable tolerances, but uh, no official dicamba resistance. And you're absolutely right, there's a lot uh, in Tennessee across the river, so likely we have it. We just haven't sampled any yet or found it or, or got a call on it. So we know that we're losing um, sensitivity, I guess, uh, to a lot of our post herbicides with pigweed populations. And uh, again, like I said, we're focused on some three key populations this winter. Uh, there'll be more to come on, on what we find. All right, Tom, just kind of to follow up on that. I know you say we don't have any, but if we do, or when we get down that road, we'll, we'll enlist a plus liberty, be effective when we do have, when and if we do have dicamba resistant pigweed? Well, that's a good question. And uh, we know that our en enlist uh, crops aren't tolerant to dicamba and our dicamba crops aren't tolerant to enlist. But uh, when we start talking about pigweed populations, if they do have an inherent tolerance to uh, dicamba, Herbicide, they will likely have at least, at very least, some increased tolerance to 2,4-D. Now, us being able to tank mix, glucosinate with the 2,4-D is going to help a lot in controlling those type of populations. And, uh, you know, that's why, that, that's what the enlist system gives us is the flexibility to legally uh, tank mix those two products uh, helps us uh, get better control of those subsequent populations. All right, and and just the the kind of the third in the series for you, Tom, is break herbicide. And I know I've heard you mention before that that break is like the best money. But but what are your thoughts on break on uh, in enlist cotton? And you kind of cut out, but I think I'm reading reading the question here. So uh, break and enlist cotton actually. Uh, we had break plus cotterand in the plots that I, I showed on the video today. Uh, for whatever reason, we didn't, it didn't make it in the video cut, but, but break is an excellent pre-emerge herbicide. I do recommend it on a lot of our cotton acres. The downside to break is the price. And so when you look at a pint of cotterand plus a pint of caparol, a lot more economical than a pint of break and a pint of cotterand. But uh, a lot of times we get what we pay for with these residuals. And as long as we keep getting rain, frequent rainfall in the spring, break gets reactivated. And, and we don't lose activity as quickly as we do with some of these other products. So uh, absolutely, I think it's a great tank mix partner regardless of the technology. Uh, in a system like in list where we have multiple post-emergent options, uh, I will say that the, you know, the use Maybe a little less just because of the price in that type of system. But any, you know, anywhere where we need extended residual control, a uh, break is going to be the product to put in that uh, put in that field. I tell people all the time if you've got uh, specific fields in mind with just overwhelming pigweed populations, then break needs to be in that field uh, mixed with something. And you know when we talk about tank mix partners, to me I. It could be anything. If we're in the extend system, uh, assuming these new uh, formulations of dicamba get re-registered uh, and it's prior to our cutoff date, then, then dicamba can be a tank-mix partner. Cotteran has been a pretty consistent tank-mix partner. Caparol, uh, kind of diurnal. So several things, partner with break, uh, make your weed control system look really good. All right. Uh, thanks, Tom. 
Uh, I've got a couple of questions for, for our entomologists, but Tom, I've got one more question for you that just popped up, and I want to chime in on this a little bit. The question is, will enlist cotton acreage increase in 2021 with dicamba labels being vacated in 2020? And, and even without the dicamba issues, from what I'm seeing with, with our enlist varieties, we're seeing, I, I feel like, some pretty good uh, yield potential in some of those varieties. So regardless of the dicamba labels, I really feel like that the acres of enlist cotton will increase. So what's your, what's your thought on that with the, the dicamba situation the way it is? Well, I think, Bill, especially considering our cutoff date, I mean, when we talk about cotton and, and when we plant cotton, uh, at most uh, prior to the cutoff date, we may get one application in, maybe two if we put something out at planting, uh, some biochemical simulation out at planting, but it doesn't give us as much flexibility on the end of the season. And so uh, I'm with you. Uh, I think if, if we don't get a re-registration in dicamba uh, for four of these dicamba simulations, it may increase the, the enlist acres, but but also, I mean, we planted the phytogen 400 in all our plots this year, and that cotton looks really good. If it picks half as good as it looks, I'm with you. I think that uh, a lot of people may go to that one next year. All right. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Gus, uh, Ben, uh, we've got some, some uh, questions for you that I want to run your way. One uh, we got just a while back. When when will the Thrive On technology be available to growers? Do you have any any firm dates on that? Yeah, we're looking uh, at some. They're hoping the company is hoping that it'll be deregulated as soon as next year. That it might be deregulated, and that'll mean they can put it out over some acres and let growers and consultants look at it on a larger scale. Now we, we've had the opportunity uh, to evaluate it. You know, a lot of times what you see in a small plot doesn't really relate to what happens when you get it out in, in the grower's hands. And so it's important that you look at it at a, on a larger scale to make sure that the, the, the qualities and the, and the control that you're getting are real and not just a small plot situation. So we had the opportunity to do that this year on some large acre crop destruct and and uh, very positive results on, on control with thrips and plant bugs. So they're hoping to have it deregulated next year and that'll mean some, some limited release and then possibly in the grower's hands uh, are available to them in two years is, is my best guess at this point. All right, thanks Gus. I know when, when we look at pest management in Arkansas and cotton, pigweed and, and plant bug are our are, are, are most troublesome pest. Are there any new, you know, we talked about this new technology, are there any new insecticides coming along for plant bug control? And I don't know if that's a Ben question or a Gus question. Well, we've, we've looked at some uh, pretty promising insecticides over the past couple of years, uh, but they still have a, have a ways before they get, uh, get labeled. So uh, there's promise, but uh, we just, we're gonna have to see if they get labeled or not. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, we've got some other questions, one, and you know, I want to kind of go back to some of the first, one of the first one questions we got and want to gear this toward Matt. You know, we talked about water infiltration and, and kind of what that does for the, the effective rooting zone of the plant. But what, what are some things that, that a farmer can do to impact water infiltration in their field? That really goes back to kind of the treatments we're looking at in the soil demonstration fields. And that's uh, implementing no-till uh, and cover crops. And so what that does is uh, we know that tillage destroys soil structure, um, kind of like crumbling up a, a cake. You know, if you break it up, it's it's not gonna have good structure anymore. Um, the living roots of that cover crop are going to um, really increase uh, soil structure and 
root exudates are gonna help hold those soil particles together um, and allow water infiltration to go down those root channels once the cover crop is terminated. And then also the cover crop residue is gonna lay down the soil surface and um, really help uh, prevent uh, silting in uh, when you have high impact rainfalls. I don't know if you've ever looked at uh, videos of, of rainfall hitting a bare soil. It's, it's quite dramatic close up and, um, and, and that, that really is what causes that silting in a uh, crusting effect. And so when we have soil coverage, it really helps prevent that and allows that water to infiltrate right there at the soil surface. All right, thanks, Matt. I know when we've done meetings together and producers ask about cover crops, uh, I know one of the first things you ask them are, you know, what's your objective? And we've got a question on what type of cover crops do you recommend to optimize weed suppression? And, and I, I'd kind of like to hear what you and, and Tom both have to say on this, on this question. Well, for, for me, um, I, I would just say any grass. Um, it's going to have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio um, it, when you terminate it in the spring, which means it's going to lay there on the soil surface longer, help shade the soil, um, prevent soil temperatures from fluctuating, and um, shade the ground and help prevent uh, weed seed germination. And so there are some other things that goes on with certain grasses like cereal rye, uh, possible allelopathic effects. And so I have went beyond my knowledge base. And so Tom, may can speak further on this. Uh, yeah, man, I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, we, I've heard Trent say it, I think, that, that uh, seal rye is kind of a training wheel cover crop, I guess. And, and uh, it, it is a really good, easy to establish, in my opinion, cover crop. Uh, the thing we have to remember, regardless of which one we plan, if we're doing it for weed suppression, we really need biomass uh, in the spring. And so uh, we, we can't terminate it so early that uh, we don't have that biomass present. And cereal rye is one of those that, that um, you know, it, it gets a lot of biomass. It's easy to plant. It's easy to terminate. I really like cover crops that are easy to kill when we want to kill them. Um, so it, uh, it does, you know, it does provide the biomass we need if we terminate it uh, once it's large enough to give us that mine. Uh, so, um, I like cereal rye. I see a question here. I don't want to skip ahead, Bill, but it just popped up in front of me about black oak. And I don't know if that's Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Jump on that, Tom. It, well, in regards to weed control, we have looked at black oaks and, and uh, black oaks to me, uh, they, they provide a larger leaf. Uh, I'll let the others chime in on this. We looked at black oak one year, I think. But uh, to me, it, the variety that we had didn't get quite as tall as the cereal I did. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, we may have to plant more of it than uh, we, we do from a sitting rate standpoint of cereal rye, I'm not sure. But, but uh, we looked at a blend one year of, of uh, cereal rye and black oaks, and it, from a weed control standpoint, was, was probably equivalent. What do you think, Bill? Yeah, I, I agree. The I really like a blend of cereal rye and black oats because the 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 rooting density is it, and the rooting profile is a little bit different on the black oats. It is a it does have a wider leaf. I think it just helps give us, even though it is another grass, it just helps improve the amount of diversity that we have in our cover crop. And and I know some folks are using uh, kind of a combination between the cereal rye and the black oats and even a little bit of hairy vetch. It doesn't take much hairy vetch, especially if you're going in front of cotton. But, uh, but I do get questions on allelopathy on the black oats and on the cereal rye. And, and when we do leave them out in the field for a long time and they get very mature, the carbon nitrogen ratio is very high. And I don't know, but what some of the impact we may have on slowing down the cotton growth is, is allelopathic. Uh, issues are soil microbes needing additional nitrogen and, and they, we have so many soil microbes in, in the field they're they're much more adept at, at getting nitrogen from the soil than the cotton roots but uh, so the the lilopathy thing is, is really uh, something I have some questions on and, and don't fully understand. Now 
Now, um, any other comments on the, on the cover crops that anybody wants to make? Okay, um, we got one question that come in. Uh, you know, we have some late planted cotton in Northeast Arkansas. What is the last day you feel comfortable defoliating it? Um, you know, if we look at kind of what's going on, especially this weekend, we're going we're going to have some nighttime temperatures in the mid 40s, and uh, basically the our plant activity is really slowing down. I feel like that that some people have still been using drop in their uh, first defoliation mixture on their leaf drop mix. And a lot of them, you know, it's it slowed down some, but a lot of them feel like they're still getting activity out of drop. But those days are, are really numbered. Those days are almost gone. And when we get into a situation where our nighttime temperatures get so cold that we can, we can hold off on defoliating cotton a month or we can do it now, and there's really not going to be any difference in the maturity of the fiber. And so uh, when we kind of get toward this end of the year, you know, we can't get too far ahead of our pickers, but I really like to try to defoliate cotton while we have heat units to make some of these products work because as we get cold, then our, our hormone type products just work so slow. But we do have, uh, I think, some decent options with, uh, with some of the PPOs and other things that follow into that. And I know, Tom, you and I have talked about harvest stage strategies, you know, as our temperatures drop and all that. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I agree with you. I mean, I, I always like looking at that forecast and, and what it's going to do three to four days before I spray it and three to four days after I spray it. But, but like you said, like uh, some old time cotton farmers always told me about October 1, it's time to throw the cotton regardless. And so, you know, it's, uh, I agree. I think we need to stay ahead of the pictures. Uh, at this point in time, we're relying, or I recommend more by herbicide type defoliants uh, with the cooler temperatures, you know, hay, DP, uh, or folex, uh, death, whatever. Um, but I'm like you, you know, if we catch a rain and we catch any of these little systems that come through, I'd rather have leaves on the cotton unless my pictures coming down the road. But it will take, you know, like you said, it's going to take a little more time to get these leaves to fall off in these cooler conditions. So you got to keep that in mind while you Stay ahead of the picture as well. All right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Matt, I want to put you back on the spot again. Here's a, here's a question. What happened to tillage turnips? You know, it was a big thing a few years ago. Uh, you want to talk about kind of what we run into, especially on data planning and some of the issues we have with that and talk about where we are with tillage turnip, the, the, the tillage turnips now or tillage radish. Yeah, so, you know, Bill mentioned goals always. When I talk about cover crops and what we're going, what a producer wants to plant, I always ask their goals. Um, you know, tillage turnips or radishes, they have you know, that deep tap root. They can help with some deep infiltration. Um, but really, that cover crop does 90% of its growth in the fall. And so, if you're getting in early, um, late September, I wouldn't go in, I wouldn't go past mid-October with those any brassicas as far as establishing those in the fall um, because they do most of their growth in the fall and then typically winter kill. Um, and so if you don't get in early with those, um, you're just kind of wasting your money throwing seed out there. It's not going to get much growth on it and not going to do you much good as far as um, increasing infiltration and, and giving you some biomass in the field. So that's kind of the main thing I would say about that. Um, but, but they are good to really increase some diversity um, in our cover crops because we don't really grow a brassica for a cash crop in most situations in the state. So um, it, it'll be, it, it's a good cover crop to throw in there to, to improve uh, diversity, so. Okay, uh, Tom, just to kind of a follow up on that. You know, we've got a little bit of time. We're getting about 10 minutes left. Uh, you know, if we plant the tillage radish late and we don't get good winter kill and they go to seed, I've heard some people talk about that uh, that volunteer uh, tillage radish is, is, is pretty tough to handle. You got any comment on that? Uh, 
Yeah, and so we've had some situations, I guess, in South, Southeast Arkansas, where uh, we've had some go to, to bloom. And I guess our experience is it's a lot harder to kill while it's blooming, as a lot of these other cover crops probably are. But, but uh, you know, it takes a much more significant mixture of herbicide to, and, and maybe more than one treatment to knock it out, especially if it's solid tillage radish. You know, when we, I guess when folks were experimenting in the beginning, the whole field may be tillage radish. And so if you have a whole field of nothing but tillage radish, and it blo goes to bloom, it, it can be much bigger deal to take care of that. If it's in a blend, where there's not quite as many, uh, and you leave a few, I don't know that it's hurting a lot, but, but uh, when the insect guys make the touch on the green bridge and that kind of thing, but, but uh, you know, for me, it's a lot harder to kill than, than cereal rye. The cereal rye, just a little bit of glyphosate, and it's dead for the most part. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, back to the Thrive On, I think this is a question I overlooked, and, and I, I assume that the Thrive On technology is going to be available with the other traits, uh, herbicide traits and bulgar traits. That, that is correct, isn't it? Yeah, part of the Part of what we did this year was screening several varieties of uh, cotton that had Thrive On plus all the other attributes, the, the, the traits. So th the plan is to bring it forward with, with those other traits. You know, it, it, it wouldn't do much good if we, if we couldn't kill pig weeds and, and got plant bug control. So yeah, yeah, it's, they'll be with others. All right. Well, with guess with the tools that we have now, what what are the your best go-to uh, products to give us good control of thrips? What products are currently available to do that? Okay. So so either Benny or I could answer this, but but obviously you know from the video that you saw. Uh, the aldicarb in furrow uh, has provided a su superior level of control for thrips in our trials for the last several years. Uh, some of the other things that, that have worked uh, better are uh, acephate in furrow, uh, also admire uh, in combinations of products like uh, imidacloprid on the seed plus acephate uh, in for or even on the seed. So acephate, the old triple treated seed that a lot of people remember, is still providing uh, some of the better levels of control that we see. Aris is another product that that is still providing decent control. I feel like all the neonics are starting to slip pretty bad right now. You know, we first saw it with Cruiser Thymothoxam, but we feel like we're beginning to see a little slippage. And, and by the way, uh, we ran some trials this year and, and uh, some bioassays in cooperation with Scott Stewart in Tennessee, where we saw uh, acephate uh, foliar applications. We're beginning to, to see a little tolerance to thrips with uh, the acephate uh, foliar application. So uh, I'm glad that the Thrive On's coming on. I think it's going to help our growers get over the hump with the with that early season pest. But but uh, we're we're kind of running out of bullets uh, on on thrip control, particularly in those bad years where we have to make foliar applications. It can get kind of expensive and. And it kind of opens the door for other pests like mites and aphids to pop in on us. And, and so anything that we can do to, to, to avoid those kind of secondary type pests are, are what we're always shooting for and looking for. And, and you know, if I, if, it, if I was growing cotton, uh, you know, on a large scale like our growers are, you know, I'd be looking right now, you know, aldicarb seems to provide the the best level of control of all all the products out there but we can manage without it but it, it just makes it uh, difficult in those heavy thrips years yeah uh going guess going 
or Ben, Ben too, going, going back to Aldicarb, you know, we've, we've really gotten spoilt with 12 row planters and putting nothing in the planter, but seed. We can, you know, if we have two or three of those in the field, we can cover a lot of acres. And so going back to out, have, having Aldicarb in there would really change kind of some of the way we do things. So, so I can see some of the issues that we're running into. Um, I've got another cover quad. Well, it's not really, I, I can see it related to cover crop, but we got, you know, this here's a question on uh, glyphosate resistant ryegrass control and stale seed bed systems at planting. And I see this sometimes when we have like in front of cotton, if we have cereal rye out there and we have ryegrass, then it seems like, you know, you just have a wildfire going and, and the cereal rye gets worse and worse over time. But um, Tom, what, what do you think about what what are what are uh, strategies for for glyphosate resistant ryegrass, you know, in our cotton and maybe in what are your thoughts on with for trying to use a cover crop and what are your thoughts on trying to use just conventional uh, systems? Well, that's the you know with the cover crop part into that it makes it a difficult question. But if we're just talking about uh, glyphosate resistant ryegrass controlling the stale seed bed system. You know, honestly, if we're going to cotton, waiting until spring uh, is really not the thing we need to do. We need to think about what we're gonna do right now. And so if I've, if I've got fields, especially, you know, we're, we're seeing a tremendous movement, I guess, of glyphosate resistant ryegrass from south to north throughout the state. And especially south of I-40, the pressure's getting uh, heavier and heavier, and we see it move further north every year. And so if you have a field you're going to cotton or beans uh, that you know has a heavy population or, or a lot of pressure from resistant ryegrass, we need to go, I say now, but really uh, by the second week, third week of October, and start thinking about some group 15 residuals like dual, like Zidua, uh, to go out and, and put those out and, and hopefully get some residual control, that's really the easiest way to manage a large population of glyphosate resistant ryegrass. Now, if it's up by the time we do this, we can put bromoxone in with it. Uh, we can put select in with it as well uh, prior to, you know, prior to November. And once it gets cool, the activity of select goes down uh, tremendously. But uh, when we, if, we, if we don't do that and we have that population out there, by the time we get to spring burn down, you know, that, that, that root mass is larger. The plant above ground may not be that big, but the root mass is going to be pretty large. Uh, it's going to be hard to kill, even with select. Uh, but select would be the recommendation. A lot of growers need to select when it's around up and burn down and, and have some decent results. Uh, if we wait until that ryegrass goes reproductive, uh, we're basically in a gramoxone window. And it's usually, if we wait that late, it's going to take two applications of a paraquat or a gramoxone uh, herbicide to, to do any good prior to planting. So the easiest way to manage glyphosate resistant ryegrass is, like I said, in October, early November with residuals. If we have a cover crop out there, we can't... Uh, we really can't select the ryegrass out of that cover crop, especially a, a cereal rye or a black oak. If it's, in the, if it's in the cover crop blend, then we're not going to kill the ryegrass out of here and not kill the cover crop. So, you know, my thought on that, and I haven't really seen this play out, uh, but my thought on that is the earlier we establish a cereal rye or cereal rye, black oak blend, whatever cover crop, the easier it's going to be to uh, overcompete ryegrass that may come up in the field. So, uh, if we can get our cover crop established before the ryegrass begins to emerge uh, and get a good cover or ground cover from our cover crop, we might can choke some of the ryegrass out. Now, I'm not saying we're going to get all of it, but the population should be reduced. Uh, but once it's in a, a grass cover crop, we're not going to select for it. We're not going to. Uh, be able to kill it and not kill our cover crop. All right, Tom, that, that's a really good point on getting our, your cover, your cereal rye and maybe even black oats planted early to outcompete that. Matt, have you got something else you want to add to this? 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, earlier I said any grass uh, to improve infiltration. I should clarify that we never recommend planting uh, annual rye as a cover crop in our row crop system. Uh, Tom, I, I think I've heard you say one time that, that y'all tested some annual rye and about 50% of the seed out of the bag was Roundup resistant. So we don't want to be spreading that around. Yeah, that that's a really good point. Uh, I'm glad you glad you you mentioned that. I know we're we're a little short on time. Uh, you know, we started off talking about some of the challenges of 2020, and uh, Hurricane Laura was certainly one of those, and uh, certainly had some impact on our cotton crop. Not as much as I thought it was going to. Uh, a lot of it depends on where you were. I know, like in Mississippi County, I think they only got a couple of inches out of it. But as we move further south, we got more rain. Uh, the, I think the big damage come from like my house, I had four inches of rain out of Hurricane Laura. I got another four inches on about that 10 to 14 days afterwards. And that 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 extended wet period, I think, is really hurting us. Our early cotton, I'm, I'm, we had a lot of bull rot. We had a lot of hard lock. And I'm hearing uh, some, some really much, you know, some low yields coming out of some of our early cotton. I think maybe our late cotton will, will fare a little bit better. But this really, we went a little bit over on time. apologize for that. But I'm hoping that, that this session um, is, is one that um, really helps you out. And uh, I want to, uh, to remind everybody that, you know, while this is the, the final online commodity session or commodity field day for the 2020 season, uh, we want to thank everyone who participated. If you have any feedback from these events, you can reach us at aaes.uark.edu slash contact. Uh, if you'd like to watch any of these presentations again, please visit the website aaes.uark.edu slash field days. Thank you all and have a great night. Thank you for joining us for the Arkansas Cotton Field Day Online. We would like to thank the Cotton Growers of Arkansas, the Arkansas Cotton State Support Program, and Cotton Incorporated for their support. This program was produced by the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. To view recordings of these presentations, visit aaes.uark.edu slash field days.